So, Joe, what's been your favourite show that you've you've done so far? Um, probably Last Ship. Um, the thing that I really like that I've really liked about working on Last Ship is that sort of from day one, it was all it was being rebuilt. It ran on Broadway. It didn't do as well as they wanted it to do. And so they bought it sort of back to Newcastle where it sets um, and they sort of wanted to rebuild the whole show. And the really nice thing about that is it was a new creative team. Everyone on it was different except for Sting and Sting musical director. Um, so other than two, two members of the creative team, everyone else was different. And so everyone sort of had a little bit of input. It, it was sort of a very easygoing, free flowing sort of process. It wasn't... Nice. Uh, you know, I think we've probably all worked on shows where we go in and there's a strict vision of what's going on and we as technical sound people don't really get any say in anything. Yeah. But it was great to sort of be behind the board and to be able to lean over to Seb Frost and sort of say, what about, why don't we try this? What about, what about giving this a go? And for Seb to be receptive, which is a, a great quality in him, but also to be able to pass on ideas that would then go into the show that the director would, would like or members nice. of the cast. So it was sort of, um, you felt like you could be a little bit creative on the job while still being in a technical role. And also the music's great. Yeah, the songs Just, are. The songs are awesome. Sting is a lovely man to work with and work for. And he's really passionate about taking it to places. I don't think he's, you know, I mean, obviously, everyone wants the show to do well, and it does do well. Yeah. But I think for him, it's more important that just the show is happening and people are seeing it. So, you know, he wants to take it to Toronto. He wants to take it to the states. So there's there's talk of it going to other places in the future, and that's nice. that's really great. You know, it feels a bit like a passion project, but it feels Good. that way for everyone. That's that sounds like a really lovely process. Yeah, it's, it's a great show. I think I'd probably know this one, Jen. But what's your favourite show been? It is but out of hell, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, is the question why? Yeah, tell us why, why you liked Bat so much. Uh, well, it was my first job as a number two, uh, and I got interviewed for it uh, by Gareth and his associate at the time, Ollie, uh, Gareth Owen, it's his show. Um, and it was all quite quick. I got interviews in he's in an office and then I got a phone call from the number one and um and it went from there really um and we within a few weeks I was up in Manchester creating a kind of crazy um backstage plot there was a pond there was you know there's water there's fire there's confetti there's you know smoke there's just absolutely everything was in that show um so it was interesting to create that plot and deal with all the curveballs costumes wigs uh it was just everything was there um and then to be able to take it from manchester to london and then go from a number two to taking over as number one was amazing because i love that show and putting it in the dominion as well where we all rocky was which was i love that show um and to have it being so epically loud it was pretty special actually um yeah it was yeah. it was great it was a fantastic show i was lucky enough to were well, you lucky enough to, i was lucky enough for you to get me in to do some depping on it which was well, it was my first west end for you and was it? It was, yeah it was great yeah. i really enjoyed that yeah, and yeah the, the, actually the plots on it as well which is crazy because you had on stage yeah. markets and guitars and it there really was everything sticky in. blood <laughs> yeah um and like Joe was saying, you know, you got to have creative input as well. Every time we take that show in a different venue, we change things and you nice. could you absolutely have that input. And we got on, like the music department, sound department got on so well. It's just so nice when that happens. Yeah. It's always good when, they, when that click between sound and music just, just works. Makes everyone's lives just that bit easier. It does. Um, just while we're here, I'm going to stop briefly. If you message the standings, so if you go to the chat, if you've got any questions, if you message standing by rather than everyone, that just pops up on my screen so I can, I can pass on any questions. Um, I'm gonna go to uh, an attendee question now. Um, let's go for this one, because I think that's quite important. Uh, what have you both been doing to keep busy during lockdown? 
And have you used any of your skills from theatre to survive in the COVID world? And that is from Stephen. Sweet, nice question. Uh, Jen, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, well, in January, I started a personal training course because fitness is something I'm really interested in. So I actually used the time to be able to qualify as a personal trainer, uh, which is great. Uh, it was lots of studying, lots of uh, online stuff. And yeah, so I've used the time to... No, I mean, retraining, I think, is a, is a strange way of putting it, but I've just learned another skill. Um, and I've also, there have been lots of, um, you know, you've probably seen it on Instagram and Facebook, of so many people doing, like, streaming concerts and things like that. So I've done quite a lot of tech support for people that have done, like, Vimeo streams or um, any online stuff that are, over, like, they're quite large audiences, so, like, yeah. 100 plus people where servers can go down and you know sound quality can drop because they're using but it's basically actors with a speaker and a or just a computer and it's you know they're dancing around a room and then you've got people saying they can't hear and it's just being that person that you can just sort of like fight off all of that um but other than that uh other than talk i've been talking to some students um and talking about sound a lot and doing some wet doing lots of webinars but physically doing anything no i found that nigh on impossible okay um what about you joe uh similar answer in that no not really um that's sort of been purposeful in a way because yeah. um i the first 12 weeks of um lockdown i was shielding i have a lung problem so I was purposely just staying in the house, doing as little as possible. Um, and my wife works in the NHS. So to be honest, the most of lockdown has just been trying to support her while she's doing a mad amount of shifts and a crazy amount of quite dangerous work at the moment. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It, it, she, she, she's killing it. Um, which, you know, which is obviously at the, at the start of lockdown was great because... I think we can all attest to the fact we get so little time off to be able to go, oh my God, I've got 12 weeks and I can't do anything and I shouldn't do anything. Um, it was lovely to get that time in to sort of chill out a bit. So it was sort of at the start, it was like a purposeful, oh, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to put work to one side and enjoy my time and seeing my family and supporting you know, what, what's going on here. Nice. Um, I'm now in the point where I'd quite like to do a little bit more work. <laughs> I'd quite like to use those skills again, but at the moment, um, it's not really possible. I, I sort of don't know if it's false hope at this stage to be holding out for any work, panto stuff at the end of the year. I don't know if that's false hope or not. I'm sort of resigned to maybe it not happening this year, but maybe it will. I don't know. I think the most most technical thing I've done sound-wise while I've uh, been off was editing music rounds with the family pub quiz in there. Nice. Logic. I think that's probably been it. Other than that, no, n nothing at all, really. Yeah. Yeah, I, one of my, I've got two friends that are, are video designers and they did quite, what was quite possibly the most complicated uh, Zoom quiz that has ever existed. We had uh, like proper full-blown media servers doing live content renders. <laughs> but that's what happens when very clever people get bored. Um, yeah, it's really, that's a, two really awesome ways to, sort of look at it I think like you're saying you know I think the lifestyle that we have certainly you know having that time to embrace and take that time to relax is is really important um I like this question well because I came up with it um what has been your favorite moment on a show uh Ginge one singular moment yeah that moment that you went yeah that is why I'm doing what I'm doing Okay, this is the first one that's come into my head, but actually when I think about it, it probably won't be. I remember when um, we were doing Bat and I was mixing, and there's a moment when one of the actors jumps into the pool and he does a quick change onto the water. And he always counts it every night and there's always like the safety people on stage to know if he's taken too long. But then when he gets out, he has to grab a microphone and he'd got something in his eye and he just could not find the microphone. And I saw one of the other 
a cast members on stage walked towards him so he could sing into her mic and I picked her him up on her mic and I thought that's pretty good I'll take that that sounds awesome very well but, like, quick know. thinking from everyone yes that's an awesome moment hey what about you Joe my answer wasn't anything like that really that's that's a real like tale of skill and good good sound craft I think mine was like, like, <laughs> yeah, not like that at all I think um I think I've always found it quite difficult to convey to sort of like family and friends who aren't in the industry really what it is that I do. Cause we sort of do such a hodgepodge of things, don't we? Sort of, whether you're like a production engineer doing fit ups or this week I'm sticking mics on sweaty people and now I'm mixing a musical and they think, oh, you know, that's just stood there pushing some faders around and it's not very complicated and you know, actually it's bloody hard. Um, but I think it was only last year when I sort of got to a point where I went, it was doing Joseph and I go, I'm doing the 50th anniversary production of Joseph in the London Palladium for Gareth Owen. And I've got Andrew Lloyd Webber literally coming up to me and giving me notes and to be able to say to family, this is what's going on at the moment and seeing the sort of, Oh, that's what he does. <laughs> you know, the little, the switch turn for people and go, Oh, I, I, I sort of get it now that's been a really nice moment to have now because I've just sort nice. of feel, I come from a family, everyone else in my family, sister and both parents are scientists. So I went down a slightly odd route. So uh, okay. to sort of have something for them to go, to grab onto and relate a bit to was a, was a really awesome moment to go, this is it now. Yeah, honest. and they can actually go, oh, I'm Angelo Weber, I know that name. Yeah, I know him. I know that show. I know the London Palladium. It was sort of like a perfect uh, concoction of nice. events that people finally got it. Yeah. It is weird how when like non non theatrical folk and you say you're doing something, you name drop someone, they're like, "Oh yes, now now I understand. I'm listening to what you're saying." It's like, "Yes, okay, thank you." Yeah. Yeah. It was like I did. So I'm I'm also a sound engineer, um, and I did um, a very expensive poison at the Old Vic, which which for me was an amazing show. Uh, you know, the story was great, but everyone that I knew outside of theatre sort of just saw it as another show. And the one after I did Lungs, it was um, Matt Smith and Claire Foy as a two-hander. And you say those names and everybody is like, oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> and you're yeah, like... I'm, I'm, I'm not in any way slagging off my mother-in-law. That's a very really difficult thing to do, but I'm not doing it. But she's um, quite guilty sometimes of when we talk about pantos, of being like, oh, I'm doing this panto. And the first question is, well, who's in it? It doesn't matter mm -hmm. who's in it. There's a wonderfully talented cast of actors and creatives and musicians and just come and enjoy their work it doesn't matter who yeah. the name is yeah and, pe and people quite often sort of put panto down as well i've had some of the best fun ever on pantos oh. and i think they're really important because for some people that's their only exposure to to theater in a year absolutely and, yeah. and for most people it's their first um and yeah i had i had, I had mixed a panto this year and i had the best time i've ever had on a show it was great fun apart from when i was working with Jenge, obviously <laughs> Obviously, the best fun. Yeah, I remember about age five or six being taken to see Peter Pan at Birmingham Hippodrome. And then my first job as part of you know, working with GOS was mixing Peter Pan at Birmingham Hippodrome. And I thought there's something quite prophetic about this. It's sort That's of really cool. everything's come full circle. I like that. Yeah, it was, it was when I got, when they reached out to me to do Edinburgh Kings, like that's where I remember going as a kid. And, you know, then getting to give, you know, what if like in that crowd somewhere, there's a little future sound engineer who has that same experience that I had. And, no, I think, I Actually, think that's, that's one of my favorite things um, to your other question is when yeah. people come up to the desk at the end of the show. And I've had so many parents with their like maybe 15 to 17 year old child, some, yeah, mainly boys, but a couple of girls and they're like, oh, my child really wants to do what you're doing. Like, how did you do it? And the kids stood there going, shut up, mom. Like, stop saying it. But actually, they want to know. Yeah. And when that happens, I love that. I think that's great. Yeah, I love those little desk conversations. Even if it is, oh, the lighting was really good. Bye-bye. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> <Yeah>, thanks. <laughs> I had... I'm um, here in row E7. Yeah. <laughs> I had somebody um, during Poison come up to me and go, what's all this for? So I started, you know, very you know, this is for this is the SD10, it's for the, and they went, they don't use radio mics at the old Vic. <laughs> I was like, what oh, don't they? I wonder what I'm doing then. 
<laughs> just very confident. No, they don't use radio mics at the old bit. And I was like, okay. Um, Your number two is harder than well, then. Oh, yeah. number two was amazing. She had a, a topless man, and you could not see the microphone. She was unbelievable. Sam Mullis. She was just... At one point, it was Apollo DT, and he was at the front edge of the stage, craning forward, trying to see the mic, and he couldn't. I was like... Apollo well, DT does not like seeing microphones. No. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, this was the big thing, like, you know, production meetings about this one microphone and this one scene. And Sam just knocked out of the park. She did phenomenally. Um, yes. Uh, let's find... I want to go for another uh, pre-submitted question. Um, da, 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 da. Here's a good one. What qualities do you look for in an A2 sound number two? Uh, Joe, why don't you go first? I know who sent this question in, so I'm just going to say all the qualities that Brother Lee possesses. <laughs> Um, I think as a number two, you've got to be quite diplomatic and probably more so than the, the number one in a way. You know, you're dealing with people on stage who are maybe have quite sensitive egos. I don't know if that's too harsh a way of putting it, but people who certainly if you're coming up to them all the time and faffing in their face and oh, this isn't on right, you know, they, they can get quite annoyed and stressy and they've got a lot going on and they've probably just been given 10 notes and they're trying to remember that and you're kind of faffing with them and moaning at them for sweating so i think having someone who's able to just sort of release the tension in that environment and sort of make everyone feel very comfortable and but still you know pass on those little notes from the sound department that maybe need to uh, ooh, you are you okay you know just or just a little bit louder today would be lovely if you know just sort of trying to get those little bits of information in in a very calm and nice way you can't have someone as your sound number two or sound number three on stage who is ball in a china shop who's um you know who comes across in any way aggressive i don't think those are qualities that you know are, are useful at all I mean, obviously, number two has got to be technically proficient as well. They've got to be able to fix problems for you. But I think that's a skill that can be taught quite quickly. You know, what's wrong and how to diagnose it, as opposed to an attitude, which I think is just inherent in, in a person. So I think making sure that you're coming into a sound of a two role with that attitude is, is the thing for me, at least. Nice. Yeah, sounds good. What about you, Jen? What do you look for in a, in a two? I think you nailed it. Like, they're, yeah, absolutely. You almost want to think, you know, if an actor on stage doesn't really remember talking to your number two, great, they've done their job. Like, yeah. just be discreet. Um, and also, I think as a number one, having opened a, f a few shows, I've really noticed how actually you want someone to be supportive. You want somebody who's not only obviously technical um but someone that is just you know do you want a cup of tea have you had a break today have you actually been outside the building you kind of need somebody to yeah. be a person because when you're out front you don't get that chance you are you know game face on the whole time and it is so exhausting you actually need somebody to be human and say are you okay and if the answer is no what do you need if the answer is yes, great. You know, it's just having that someone that you can go, blur, have a rant to, and then carry on. Um, but to feel the support of the team backstage is so important because if you don't feel like you're getting that support, you're fighting your battle on your own out there. Yeah. I think, I think another, another thing I was going to mention there that I, I totally had forgotten about, and is I think one of the few things with a number two that if it's not, if, if they don't do this, that I, I can sometimes get quite annoyed about, especially during tech, is a, a, just a certain level of communication from the stage as to what is going on. Because we're in the dark quite a lot of the time at front, and we often have to deal with you know, sound designers who are behind us, or associates, we're on comms, and if we don't know what's going on to pass that information on to them, they can get angsty, that comes on to us. So if there's a break and it's for sound, I want to know why, I want to know, 
if you're fixing it, I want to know how long ETA, you know, that sort of stuff pipes back to me. You know, I think even at a tech stage, it doesn't matter as much if there are mistakes, as long as those mistakes are communicated. So just sort of like a, a certain openness. Oh, sorry, I didn't have that mic there in time. I know why. We'll be a minute while we reset. That's so helpful. No, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's that and like being just anticipating problems. It's like, you know, you know what scene's coming up. You know there's a load of hats in that scene. You know there's only two of you for 20 cast members, ensemble, doing changes. You know it's going to be a problem. Flag it, notice it, pass it on, and then, you know, everyone's quite calm about it. You don't pass that on. It, it just becomes quite difficult. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, did, I like that, um, the point of being a human. I think actually, like, I, the, oh, the show I did, at some point my water ran out. I was like, oh, for goodness sake. And then I forgot, went for a drink of water. And then a stop we'd had, she'd gone around and filled up everyone's water bottles. Like little things that just make everyone's lives easier. But then yeah. it worked, you know, it works other ways. When they're then going back and rebattering, then, you know, and you're now quiet. You go and fill up her water bottle or their water bottle. Yeah, I like the human. That's a good point. Um, I like this one. What are you most excited about in getting back to work? Uh, Ginge, why not you? Um, I guess I just want to make noise again, to be honest. Like, a lot of the shows I've done are really loud. And I like it. I miss it. it you know, you get such a release. I, I Honestly, other than Harry Potter, which was obviously a play, but the, was still fairly loud, always done loud shows. Um, and you get such a release and you have, you know... And I've also done quite long shows. So it's like three hours of you and a desk, an audience with the faders, and you just switch off and you just, you're just telling a story for three hours. And actually it's quite hard when you do that eight times a week to then go back to, to normal life. And it's like, oh, I can't, there's, you know, you, you have to deal with every aspect of normal life. Whereas there, you can't use your phone, you know, None of that stuff. You are just so engrossed for, for those hours. And I just think that's, that's really nice. Um, and yeah, it will be exhausting though. I think that's quite worrying because concentrating for that amount of time is such a skill. Um, I think that will, that will be hard. Yeah, going back to it, it's going to be tough, isn't it? Yeah, but it will be nice just to be able to make stuff loud. Yeah. <laughs> and make stuff live well as well, which you do so well. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> uh, what about you, Joe? What are you most excited about? Just just getting back to work in any capacity. I mean, I don't know if anyone else has experienced this. A few years ago, my dad retired, and there was definitely a sort of six-month period of him just pottering around the house sort of uselessly, and that is exactly how I feel at the moment. I just, you know, sort of don't know how to fill your days at times. And, um, you know, you sort of got all this, you know, knowledge and, and skill that just is it, at the moment totally useless to have whatsoever and is just not in any way being used. Just to be able to get back and go, oh, thank God I'm not as useless as I felt for the last six months would be really nice, actually. Yeah. Just, to, just to do a bit of programming, push a few faders around would be lovely. Yeah, it's a good one. I'm actually going to want to keep you on the hook, Joe. I've uh, had a question coming uh, from Cam, um, just talking about uh, making a stage plot and how you, you know, the fact that you can't be everywhere at once yep. uh, and how you sort of deal with that. And I don't know, Ginger might want to be able to pipe in on this as well, but I want to bounce it at Joe first. Um, I haven't made loads of stage plots because I haven't done loads of number twoing and number three. But on the shows that I have number two and number three, it was always a matter for me of sort of as you go through tech you will pick up on entrances exits uh i did a, a lot of the shows on number two and number three were rock and roll pantos so there was a lot of handhelds coming on and off stage all the times and moving them between baskets so people could pick them up doing quick changes and all that sort of stuff so all that sort of stuff will just develop organically that's stuff that has to happen so it will just, this has to move at this time, it has to get here, 
that sort of stuff just unfolds and doesn't need to be thought about too much really um but the th thing that you'll pick up on with entrances and exits uh over time that's the stuff is that when you start to slot that in to your the thing you know the things that have to happen you fill the space in between them with that person's just come off how long are they off for do i check them now or do i check them when they come back in five minutes just make sure people get in there their, their position checks, their, if they're in wigs, you know, make sure all those things are getting checked as much as possible. And then when you've got those things down, your necessities and your visual checks, then the time in between you fill with listening. You fill with, here's this scene, it sounds fine, leave that, who are the next people on? Have they had their visual checks? Have they had their audio checks? And I mean, I was definitely guilty of this when I was the number two, so I feel really bad saying this, but since then I've worked with some phenomenal number twos uh, and they don't do what I did. And what they do is they're always working, always, all the time. If you're a number two and you're, you know, sat around doing nothing, you know, then there's a hole in your plot that can be filled with listening. There's a hole in your plot that can be filled with going and checking people, I, I think that's the best thing in a, in a backstage plot is fill it make sure you're using your time because if there's a pop or a bang or something for me out front and i'm on to you and i say what was that and the answer comes back i don't know then that's not really good enough um because unless you were away checking someone or doing a cue you should have been listening should have known what that was so i think that's my backstage plot advice, is just make sure it's full, make sure. You're terrifying. I would not want a number two for you, is all I'm going to say. <laughs> but so, I mean, maybe, you know, there's, there's excuses sometimes, but we've got wave tool now, and on a five minute listen back function, if I go, what was that? I want to know what it was. There's, there's, a, there's a tool to check that now. Well, I remember doing a show, and it was back, and we were opening in Manchester, and it was the first preview, and there's this massive bundle that happens on stage. And it's quite busy, but I was mainly at the rack. And um, we weren't using, like, that version of Wave Tool wasn't happening then, but they were obviously recording the show out front. And her, she jumped on, someone jumped on top of her, broke her mic, she opens the song next, fuck all came out and I, they were screaming at me on the radio and I swore blind that everything was fine and the response I got was well we'll find out at the end of the show when that mic did exactly break and I was shitting myself for the rest of that show and I thought I swear I checked it I swear it was fine and it was on impact that mic broke when someone jumped on it and I just thought oh my god like it was terrifying because that is my job I cannot let a broken mic go on stage. And I thought, how could I take my eye off the ball on the first preview? And I didn't, I, there was nothing I could have done. Yeah. But A, you still feel like crap. And B, I just thought, oh my God, what, what if? Horrible feeling. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna mention this again because he's here in the chat with us, but uh, Brother Lee's my most recent sound number two. And he was just um, phenomenal at using his time in the sense that I would always, you know, oh, what's going on here, the message here, and always sort of knew what was going on, who was where, catching people to fight problems, and in between, learning the mix. That was a great use of time. So when we got to mix learning, the last ship is a hard mix, and it was learned very quickly because of the time that was put in backstage. So that's a good use of time as well, if you've got gaps. I was not as good as sound number two for Brother Lee when he was mixing as uh, I was for him, because. Um, the stage manager would put a PlayStation in a dressing room and that was my downfall, unfortunately. Oh dear. Uh, have you got anything else you wanted to add, Ginge, or? Only that I'm probably very opposite. Like, Joe seems to be really methodical. Like, you do this and this and this, and then, you know, I'd look at this and this and this, and mine is very different. I'm just, um, it just, I don't know, I'm just kind of around. I'm, I actually talk to people probably more than I should. And I'll end up in a conversation, but by having the conversation, I find out what that person does. And when I'm mixing, I'll always pick 
two or three people that I know their lines backwards and then I'll work out the interactions they have with other people and then you seem to get the whole show and I kind of do that backstage as well if I know what this person those couple of people do and who they interact with I can kind of get a, a grasp of where they're all coming from um but it's it's sort of it sort of just flows a bit more rather than I I don't ever start a tech session going this this and this I just go I know what needs to happen and it happens which might just be luck but um I write stuff down and I have printouts and I have everything I need usually attached to me belts grips you know caps etc um but yeah just a very different approach do you think ginge and I, the experience that I was mentioning about myself when I was number two in was all the shows I ever number two there wasn't a number three I was the only person backstage do you think that there's a difference in how a plot should be written compared to if you are in a three-man team as opposed to in a two-man team yeah actually that's that's so tricky because I've um when I've been a number three opening a show I've always been guided by my number two and it was very clear that that's how she wanted backstage to be anyway. And because it was my first number three job opening a show, I was really grateful to that. But at the same time, she was like, be in this place, work out what cues need to be done, fine. Then on other shows, um, where I've been a number two, I've been specifically told by the sound designer, your job is to manage the number three. Your job is to manage backstage and tell him what to do. So it's almost been like a mini team backstage. And so I was creating both plots at the same time. Then when I've had a backstage team setting up and I've been out front, I've kind of said, look, it's your, you need to make backstage work, go and do it. And if it hasn't worked, then I would step in. But I, I do think it's different when you have, if it's just you, you're the only person you can blame is yourself. You have to take on all the responsibility if you've got another person, it's a bit, it's shared uh, and you can bounce off each other. You can kind of, you know, share a bit of the pressure as well. But yeah, I think it is entirely different if you're on your own. I've never had to do it on my own. Yeah, I, I think that's probably why I had to be, when I was doing it, so structured. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's no one else back, backstage for me to sort of rely on anyway. And I, you know, the way I, I know I work, is that if I didn't know on this line I need to start walking to get to this place, yeah. I, I personally would forget and <laughs> probably yeah. mess up. Yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very interesting. I, I've known number twos who take cues on music because they're just so musical and they're like, oh, this is happening in the music, I've got to go and do this. Mm. Fine. Yeah, I think that, like, because I've not opened a show as a two, but I've, you know, I've depth and I've taken over shows. And I remember it was, it was on bat. I'd come back after being away doing something else. And there was a point where I went, I, and I had the bit of paper in my pocket, but I was like, I don't, and then the music went, I was like, oh, yeah, cool, we're at that bit. And that's when I then crossed over to go and do the fun guitar run round. Um, but yeah, I like, I think it's, it's oh, sorry, John, you go. I, I was just going to say, you just sort of just half reminded me of something then, something else I'm going to add is um, a few years ago, I did a show and I didn't really know, you know, I'd sort of had a number two and a number three and I'd said, guys you you run things backstage how how you think is, is correct um and so i didn't really know what was going on with the plot until the number two was at the speed on the mix and then he would go and mix i would come backstage and you know do that plot a couple of times a week and it was at that stage i realized that there was a problem with the plot and the problem was was that the guys i had backstage were too nice and what they'd done is they'd acquired a load of cues that weren't anything to do with the sound department. Oh, and yeah. There is a place for helping other departments. You know, I've done shows in regional theatres where I was the only member of sound backstage. I wasn't very busy, you know, doing a big Shakespeare thing or whatever. So, yeah, of course, stage management, I'll help you page out a cable on a truck. I'll help you page a curtain. That's fine. But this was a touring number one UK musical there isn't room for the sound department really to be helping out with moving bits of set. We're not extra members of crew. And one of the things that had really frustrated me about the plot that they developed was they would, oh, well, I've got to go from here to here to do this. And this actor needs their water bottle, so I'm gonna take it for them as you go. 
no, absolutely don't get involved with any other department stuff. Don't get involved with trying to move actors' water bottles or anything like that. Because the first time there's a problem and we have to go and do that, it's going to mess over other departments. It's going to leave them short-handed. And then when you don't take that actor's water bottle because you're fixing the comms that have gone down, you know, no one else should really know what's going on. And that actor comes off stage and go, oh, God, sound number two hasn't brought my water bottle over. And then we're in a, in a pickle with them. It, we should just stick to doing sound, looking after our, our side of things. Unless there's an emergency, of course. Emergencies are always different. Um, now, the answer to this is probably... Oh. Yeah, Jamie? Uh, sorry, something um, went weird. Um, this is gonna, the answer to this is probably going to be, it depends. I know we had a chat about this before. But what, in you guys' experience, is the average wage of a sound number three in the West End? And that came in from Stuart. Glad we talked about this before we started the chat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you want to shout up on this one, Ginge? Sure. I mean, I think it massively depends. I can't remember if you said this in the question. Um, it massively depends on where you are in the world, in the in the you know universe of, of shows. Like touring is going to be completely different to Fringe to West End, but I think West End you're probably looking at around six hundred to six fifty. Um, it also depends on what category venue you're in. If you're in a category A venue, it could be more. If you're in a category C venue, it could be a bit less. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably the average. I've known higher. I've also known an awful lot lower. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we had actually a really interesting chat about how ridiculous some, how, uh, how ridiculously low some can be. Um, let me just see if we've had any more questions come in. Oh, here's a good one. This is from Irene. Um, how did you guys make connections that you that got you where you are? And would you recommend going to uni to study? That is a really great question. Um, I, my sound tutor at uni worked at Billy Elliot and he said, do you want to come in for the day just to like have a look around? I was like, yeah, sure. So I went in and it turned out that the chief electrician lived in Brighton as well. So we just started chatting about Brighton, talking about the commute um, and all kinds of things. And he said, do you want some debt work? And I said, yeah. And that was literally it. Um, my uni course wasn't the greatest uni course in the world. I went to ALRA, the Academy of Live and Recorded Arts, when it existed. I don't think it exists anymore. Um, it was two years and I did a top up um, in theatre arts at Sussex and turned it into a BA, um, which I didn't have to do, but I wanted to be a teacher. I, well, I, I thought I should have a backup option. Uh, so I decided to become a qualified teacher as well. Um, but um, uni was, you know, if I hadn't met that tutor and hadn't spoken to that person, I probably would have had a very different career. However, if I'd been shit at my job when I went in debt, then I wouldn't have been asked by another department to, uh, to debt for them. Um, I think university is important for so many reasons because you work crazy hours, you do crazy things, you understand every department. Um, I do think it's important that you go, it gives you a real grounding in what the whole industry is about and more and more now the universities are linked with not shows but people stage managers um production managers they all have these links now that they can get you in and i've had i had a group of people come in and uh one there was only one girl who was interested in sound and she said can i do some work experience i said yeah of course um so and also i've I think pretty much anyone who's written to me and asked me for work experience, I've always tried my hardest to get them in unless I'm in the middle of tech or cars change or something like that. And it's just crazy. But I've always tried to get people that chance to have a look, ask questions um, and things like that. So connections are, are important. How you make the connections now, I think is, is 
easier and harder i have i get lots of messages on instagram which i really like and i and i answer them and it's just hard that you can't say you know drop in and come look around because we're not there but um i think social media is brilliant for people that you know want to start making connections it's hard though because you don't want to be weird and you don't want to be like oh i'm stalking you and i see you do this can i talk to you but you can kind of gauge it from the first conversation I would, I think it was probably quite daunting and scary to somehow make that first step into getting into the industry. I don't envy anybody trying to do that. But I think there are, I think we're quite nice people. I think people do genuinely want to help. I'm, I'm going to actually jump in because both of the people involved in this, I had quite a similar thing. So I remember I emailed Gareth Owen, the designer, uh, I was in a, I'd, so I'd left uni and I went, I was a head of sound at a producing theatre up here in Scotland. And I quickly decided that wasn't for me and that I really wanted to do musicals. And off the shows I've seen, Gareth's all sounded how I thought shows should sound. There are other designers, but I really like Gareth's designs. So I emailed Gareth at two o'clock in the morning one day after deciding I was leaving. And he invited me down to Battery of Hell at the Dominion. And I sat at the desk for two shows and I kept knocking Ginger's water bottle over. <laughs> and I kept going, oh, now I've knocked the water bottle over, she'll, like, she'll never speak to me ever again. Um, and we went, you know, we went out after the show and got chatting. And then a couple of weeks later, uh, she asked me if I wanted to come and dep. And at that point, I didn't really know what depping was. Uh, but I looked it up, I asked a couple of friends, and they were like, yeah, that's... And then I went and did a, a, quite a lot of shows in the end. Um, and yeah, you were, both of you were really sort of approach of new people. Um, and yeah, and then the rest is history. But yeah, no, you're right. Like reach out to people is, and my, and what's the phrase? My DMs are open. Um, I think most people are, you know, we're all quite passionate about, about the new, because, you know, without new people, then there's no industry really, in my opinion. Just don't get better than us. Yeah, exactly. Don't steal my jobs. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, linking into that, actually, there's a question coming through. It's quite long, so I'm going to sort of try and sum it up a bit. Um, does location affect the work you get? Uh, this is from Dan. Um, he's quite rural, sort of near city as Newcastle. Uh, does that matter, or is it better to base yourself within London, Manchester, etc., or is being able to travel just as good as the expense of a flat? Um, so, I, I, I don't live in London or Manchester. I live 10 miles north of Birmingham, which I appreciate is a commutable distance to Birmingham, but Birmingham, hasn't got the thriving theatre scene that everyone seems to think it has. Um, but personally, I don't think really we live in a country that's that big that, you know, I, I, I think it depends. I mean, do you, do you drive? How good are your local rail networks? I think is an important question. Um, I lived in Liverpool when I was doing the majority of my touring. And I found Liverpool was a slightly tricky place for me, because in between, um, in between show weeks on my Sunday travel day, I wanted to try and get home and see my missus. And it's try a quickie place to get to when you're trying to do Brighton to Newcastle to just do a quick nip into Liverpool. Um, but if you haven't got those sort of um, commitments at home, then yeah, travel. Just, just um, you know, there's nothing wrong with living rurally. I know a sound engineer who's a production guy who lives right in the sticks in Cumbria, um, and he just has to fly everywhere. Um, we all know um, one of Gareth's associates, Matt, lives up in Aberdeen, and he flies down to London every week. It's, um, it's perfectly achievable, and flying's probably cheaper than driving, parking your car in London, than driving back or getting the train. So, um, and you're blessed as well, because, you're near Newcastle, and that's a great theatre. Yeah, I'm. I think also, so like touring is different because I've had to recruit a few people for jobs in the West End. If a CV's got an address on it, my first question is, 
are you going to move to London? Have you got somewhere you can stay? Mainly because the hours are, are long and I wouldn't appoint someone knowing that they're just going to be exhausted. Like, if they might be willing to do it, but I know over time it's just not going to be fair. And if, they, if, you know, if they've got somewhere they can stay or they say they've got a friend somewhere, then great. But I can move from Brighton and it's a pain in the ass. Like, it's a nightmare. Uh, I don't enjoy it. It means you can, you rarely go for a drink because you're running for a train. The trains are always crap. Um, I, I was living in London. When I, whenever I've done production periods and we've been opening shows, I will stay up in London. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not ideal, but I like where I live. Um, but certainly for opening a show, you want to be like an hour max door to door because it's just exhausting. It doesn't matter what anyone says, you never clock off at half 10 or 11. There's, especially as a number one, there's production notes and there's always, oh, let's just do that note now. And you can turn around and say no, but I don't advise it to be honest. Yeah, I'm, so I'm based up in, in Glasgow and when I've been working in, in London, I've moved down. I've, you know, I've gone into Degs, I've stayed with friends. Like I, for me, the closer the better. I, I like Jen said an hour. I, I like 35, 40 minutes because I go brain dead after a show. But anyway, it's doable. I've had a, you know, I've, so far I've had a really nice career, and I've done a lot of internationals as well. Which Glasgow's great because it's got an airport 20 minutes from my flat, so I can be most places really quickly. But London is. I think if London's your aim, I think I'm. I mean, I'm in the process uh, of moving down. I'll be down there as of next year. But uh, yeah. I think I think touring people come from all over the country, don't they? But I think West End people, I think really you do want to be getting that commute down as low as you can. Definitely get down south. My London digs, I stay with family. That's um, from the Palladium stage door to their front door is ninety minutes, and for me, that's pushing it. Yeah. Nice to have though. That's something so close. Not close enough. No, no. It's not. <laughs> you get to Brighton in that amount of time. I know, and they're in Surrey. Oh, I stayed the in. The <laughs> I stayed in Dartford over Lungs, and that was too far away. <laughs> yeah, just don't go to Dartford. Well, yeah, that was that would have been a better a better show. Um, I'm trying to think if anyone's got because we're sort of getting to time. Um, has anyone got? If anyone's got any last minute questions, just um. Chuck them in the old chat room. Um, I'm just going to make sure. Talk to us. Or talk to us. Yeah, talk to us. I'll mute your mic. So you, you all should be able to if I've clicked the right buttons. If anyone's got. All okay. the questions. Anyone? Aiden, what's your question? Who's the real ginge out of both of you? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do remember going down to the Palladium for some for any known reason, I don't know, and meeting Joe, and I was like, oh, then I'm a ginger. Excellent. Yeah. Best ginger sound engineers. Yeah. It's a shame you haven't got any um, any hair, Jamie, or we could have made it this... Uh, oh, yeah. Full, <laughs> I could have dyed it. Panel. Yeah. I've got a wig somewhere, but... <laughs> it's an ongoing joke, but... Um... <laughs> I like I got really thrown, so I was on tours. Oh, um, oh, here's a good uh, question. Um, what? Which I think I toward this. Um, what is a system or a bit of kit that you try to take on every show you do, if that's a thing you get to do? A kettle. That's an X. Yes, T. <laughs> T. The kettle, <laughs> the kettle basically goes in my pelly case whenever we're packing up, leaving somewhere. That's really I don't amazing. get to choose anything else. The rest is not up to me. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, what I'd like to have, but you don't see on any gigs anymore ever, is a CD player. Yeah. I'd love a CD player in the rig, because if, if you work for Gareth, there's a, there's a rig check playlist in QLab, and you use one of those 10, 12 tracks, is it, to rig check? About that. Oh my god, I'm bored of Drift Away by Toto. Um, <laughs> and would love to just stick a CD on for Rig Check every day, but I don't yeah, have that. I agree. I think that would be great. And uh, also, 
dressing room. Yeah. I used to work with a designer who was happy for us to chuck a CD player in the front of house rack during, uh, during prep. And, oh, my God, he used it every day. I think and we should ask, we should ask Gary. Day. It was great. Get permission for a CD player for the next one. Yeah, I'd love permission for a CD player. I don't think it's going to happen. No. Great. Well, I think unless anyone's got... Oh, oh here's a good one. Um, I've started doing some sound in Amdram, Amateur Dramatics. Any tips on how to progress and expand my skill set? That's a big last question, but let's try and answer it. <laughs> I do a reasonable amount of amateur sound designs. Not as many as I used to, but I used to do quite a few. Um, and I think the main thing that I have taken away from doing that is how best to allocate your budget, which is always really, really tight. Um, and over you know, the time that I've learned, uh, that I've been doing the amateur ones, the thing that I've just learned is don't worry about spending money on PA unless there is no PA. Use whatever they've got in-house, just make it work. The thing that will make your show sound the best and will give you the best time is to invest in your front of house package. Make sure you've got a desk that is actually good for mixing theatre on. I had to mix Phantom, an amateur production of Phantom of the Opera once on a Soundcraft VI1. Don't do that. It's not <laughs> made for it. Just, just yeah, get yourself yeah. a Yamaha or a Digico if you can, uh, if, your, if your budget will stretch for that. Um, don't try and use a stack of mini disc players or CD players to do your sound effects. It's stressful. Don't do it. Just get a laptop with the free version of QLab on if that's all you can afford. Just do that. It's going to make life so much easier. And if your budget will stretch to this at all, get yourself a multi-track recorder. You, the shows I've always typically done have been like fit up on the Sunday morning with a tech on Sunday evening or something like that. Just make sure you record that tech. If it's an amateur show, your cast are probably all still at work on Monday until five when they knock off and come to the theatre. So you can come in on that Monday, get that multi-track going, start mixing bits, making bits sound better. You've got to try and make use of that time as best you can um so yeah I, I try and pour as much budget in you can at this, to get in a good front of house position that's going to improve your workflow give you all the tools you can to maximize your time it's worth so much more than changing a, you know one of the things i do a lot of amdram sounding has got an own pa it's not the best in the world but I'd rather have an own PA and a good desk out front than a DMB PA in front of mix on a Soundcraft I one again. Yeah. Have you got anything to say on that front, Ginger? No, not really. I think that's probably nailed it. I yeah. mean, whenever I've done, and I love doing Amdram stuff. Yeah. Um, and I have always gone in and done it and then thought, oh, I want this, I want to use that, I want this bit of kit, I want to have these reverbs. and. I've ended up just pulling in favours just so I can do it, which is great. Um, and then I think for other things, it's like there are so many things like the Dante courses and, um, you know, Logic and QLab and Pro Tools and, you know, Reaper and all the, and Audacity, all the free stuff that, yeah, I know it's got its glitches and it's a pain in the ass sometimes, but there's stuff that's free that you can, play around with at home and then when you get to a venue to a session you've got an idea of how to make those three things work for you if that's the only thing you can use um, and yeah just just doing those courses reading up on stuff making making up shows and if they're I did a production of Fiddler on the Roof um, and it was in a it was in a barn and it was it was great but then I thought if if this was bigger what would I do and I just sort of did a schematic and bits and pieces of if it was bigger and it just makes you think how you can improve it with you know it's just an exercise you can do nice. like that um so i think that's us we've definitely run ever slightly over uh, i just want to say thank you everyone for coming and thanks to joe and ginge uh, i was hoping to try and announce this but the guy who does all the graphics and stuff hasn't got that done yet but we are on the first of october uh, have got a lady called Zoe Milton, who is like uh, the king of radio mic fitting. Um, she's going to do a, an hour session on sort of the introduction to uh, mic placement in theatre. 
Uh, so I will email everyone that's been here a link out to that once that launches. But it'll all go on Facebook and stuff as well. But I just thought that might be of interest to those that are here. Um, and if not, well, thank you for coming. Um, and enjoy the rest of your the rest of your Thursday and the rest of your weekend. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the questions. Thanks. Good to see you all. Thank you very much. Bye.